Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us um, at the end of this weekend, at the start of the Easter recess. It is a, another great moment for the college, and it is always a great pleasure to meet up together as academics and colleagues and hold together in our hands two new numbers of our journal, Symposia Militensia. It makes us proud and so fulfilled in the academic sphere. Today, we are here to launch two volumes, um, which have been um, edited by two editorial teams and by two different editors, we'll get the details later on. And um, uh, we will also have some time to meet various panelists who will give their experiences on the conference and also on a paper they published in one or both of these two numbers of symposia. We'll also have a brief moment where we shall together, me and Elaine, give you some input on this year's conference. But let us kick off immediately by passing on immediately the word to um, Mr. Paul Schwirep, our principal, who will give us a brief address. Mr. Schwirep. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, I always look forward to the launch of Symposium Meditensia. For me, it has particular significance, particularly this year in view of the fact that we are launching two editions, as, as you have rightly said, the current COVID-19 pandemic with all its constraints and the fact that the launch is coinciding with the 25th anniversary of the Junior College. In fact, this is perhaps my first opportunity this year to make reference to this important landmark in the history of the college. These 25 years have been a, rem a remarkable journey. One can plan for a journey, but a journey is what it is. In spite of all the plans one may make, one can never be sure about the course that it will take. Sometimes the journey leads, leads us to un uncharted territories, and sometimes it can lead us to unexpected surprises. Symposium Meditensia was part of this journey. The journey, the journal itself has its own journey. Today, please allow me to share with you some recollections and reflections linked to the journey symposium. It all started around 2013, 2003, give or take uh, a year. At the time, the college was still in its early years. We, by we I mean the lecturers at the time, were still very excited and motivated to, to be part of the new college. We used to spend a lot of time on campus, which gave us the opportunity to discuss various topics and come up with new ideas. <laughs> one, of the, one of the issues which used to crop up was how to create a platform where we and others can publish their research. The publication of a journal was frequently mentioned. However, this required a form structure as well as financial support. As the idea gained ground, a meeting was held for all those interested. I still remember that meeting, which was held in room 247. Now we're calling it Sala 247. Uh, perhaps some of you were present for this meeting. I'm not saying I was the only one, but I was, I was there. The meeting was formal and managed by a number of staff members, one of whom was Sandra Lanfranco, um, Regretfully, I only remember his name, but I know Sandro personally, so this is why perhaps I, I, I still remember him. Probably there were uh, those who were on the first editorial board of symposia as well. During that meeting, we discussed and debated the idea, going into various aspects, particularly that it needs to be a sustainable endeavor. The college administration at the time gave its support to the initiative. And in 2004, the first edition was published and continued, as you know, pub being published till today. After a few years along this journey, the, jour the journal entered another phase. It was felt that the, it, it required a revamp. And for this reason, as from 2011, the journal was given a fresh look and there were plans to change its format as well. 
After a few more years, the editorial board was finding it more difficult to find contributors, although they eventually always managed to do so. It was felt that unless the journal is given another injection, give it a new lease of life, there was the danger that it would die a natural death. In 2017, I hope I'm, I'm right with the, with the date, the Junior College organized the first annual multidisciplinary conference. The proceedings of the conference were published in the edition of that year of symposium. The idea was to complement and integrate the two initiatives of the college, the journal and the conference. Those participating in the conference would have a platform to publish their work if accepted, while the journal would have a sustainable source of contribution. In spite of this, there, were, there was still concern for the journal. However, the issue was never whether or not to continue publishing it, but rather how to, how to raise its standard, how to make it more relevant, how to make it more accessible, and how to ensure that it continues growing. In 2019, a new editorial team was appointed, and their first important task was to come up with a new format for the journey. Symposium Militancia is now mainly an online journey with only a limited number of hard copies. As from the first edition, all contributions can be found online in the open access mode to make them accessible to a much wider audience. The link and collaboration with the multidisciplinary conference will continue, while both have the possibility to develop independently. Today's launch is an example of this collaboration. As we are pressed for time, I will give my reflections on the conference in another occasion. But before I end, I would like to thank the executive committee, Dr. Karkir Kopp, Mr. Lane Borch, and Dr. Benedice Satariano, as well as all the members of the conference organizing committee and the members of the scientific committee and the editorial board of Symposium Militancia. I would also like to thank uh, Mr. Duncan Gatt from, from my office, from the principal's office, for his significant contribution to the publishing of the journal, as well as the support of the librarians. On this special occasion of the 25th anniversary, of the college, I would also like to thank all past editors, board members, and contributors whose work uh, contributed immensely to the current status of the journey. Thank you for attending and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Shwirev. Um, um, let us now immediately, Elaine and I, and we shall discuss together a bit um, the new format of the conference. As you know, we have quite undergone quite an upheaval and uh, we are obviously reinventing uh, our conference status in the new normal. Um, and we will start off immediately by uh, telling you that the conference is going to be held. It is obviously scheduled for the 14th and for the 15th of September. 2021 and we are conceiving it obviously to be online but we are still keeping the possibility open for an on-campus access for the conference so we are opting for an online and simultaneously on-campus access conference the choice obviously lies with the participant and this will be done on registration as conference organizers obviously we want to keep our eyes wide open for any developments from the University of Malta's health directives, from the Ministry of Health and on the pandemic circumstances. But we are still hoping very much to be able to offer that option to our conference participants. Um, something else which maybe Elaine would like to discuss is the team. You know, this year, um, uh, yes? Um, as as you can see, even from the poster that we have, um, we have added, we are not, um, as of this year, um, closing 
um, our conference or linking our conference to any one particular team. This being um, that anyone who has any issue, any topics that they would like to share with us, will be free to do so, Ooh, and they will not be um, tied to any theme for that particular year. This we are doing, we heard you, and we find that this rather constraints um, the author rather than gives them uh, a direction. So we heard you and we are trying, we, are, we will continue to, to hear you and put forward your, um, your views in our conference. Our thought on this was that mainly uh, being at a multidisciplinary conference, uh, we have to create a circle of knowledge and we have to be encyclopedic, just like Dante would have taught us to be. Today, this year, we are celebrating the 700th anniversary of his death. And the great lesson of multidisciplinarity is to be all inclusive and all encompassing. So we did away with the fixed theme for every year and we are welcoming anyone who would like uh, to share with us you know, any developments or novelties in his field of research. Um, this year, obviously, the presentations will be done online, uh, even though it will be with on-campus access, the conference participants will have all the facilities ready here, should they opt uh, to do so at the conference premises. And uh, the presentations will be 20 minutes long, with a 15-minute presentation and obviously five-minute question time, as was the norm on previous conferences. And uh, this year we have a little novelty in the way to submit your abstracts. Um, we have a form uh, which is available online for you, whereby every participant will submit his name, surname, email, title of a possible presentation and a 250 word abstract, which is equivalent to uh, 1,700 characters. This is the call for abstracts page, which Duncan is kindly showing you. Uh, right away, mid midway across the page, uh, you will see there to click here and obviously open the form for the uh, submission of the abstract itself. If Duncan can go up a little bit, he will see it there. You know, click here and submit the following. If interested, kindly click here and submit the following. Um, there you will be obviously asked also, not only for the abstract, but also five keywords. So it's an electronic form and it's very easy, very straightforward. And if anybody right from now has any proposal uh, for an abstract, um, may he go ahead, here is the form for us. Thank you very much. It's all very simple. We'll receive it in our inbox, the conference uh, inbox, and then it will be obviously vetted by the uh, scientific committee. So this is something also which is uh, a novelty. Um, again, this year we have another beautiful concoction of uh, keynotes. Um, we have five who are confirmed for this year. And I will immediately, without more ado, present to you the first one. Um, Professor Tiziana Andina. It is a great pleasure um, to be able, and very proud, also thanks to the contact with uh, Mr. Nicky Young, uh, to be able to uh, share with you through our conference the knowledge and research of this fantastic scholar. She is a professor of philosophy at the University of Turin in Italy. Um, she is a disciple and a colleague of Professor Maurizio Ferraris from the University of Turin as well. She had originally intended to come for a conference when Ferraris was here previously, but to other, due to other commitments, she put it away. She is director of the research center called Labont, you know, Laboratorio di Antologia. It's a center for the study of ontology. Now, probably most of you will be already had scratching and saying, what is ontology? Ontology is that branch of philosophy um, that studies concepts such as existence, being, hence ontos, ontology, becoming reality. And Tiziana Andina is a top scholar in this field. Her monographs and her publications are numerous. You can go onto the webpage and have a good read over there. Um, her recent, uh, recent uh, research interests include aesthetics, philosophy of art, especially the question of definition in art, social ontology, of course, transgenerational action, the relationship between different generations in our society, and problems of intergenerational justice. So she will surely deliver us an outstanding keynote speech. She's a very fluent speaker in English, and uh, we have also uh, definitely 
a really valuable keynote here to follow. Let us hear about the second one. Elaine. Um, uh, we're moving on, Duncan, to? Father Joe. Father Joe Borch. Father Joe Borch is, um, he might be known to us in Bikirkara because um, Father Joe Borch um, is a priest in the Bikirkara parish priest, but he's much more than that. Um, he is currently um, um, a part of Indochus Media since January of 2017, um, and also um, RTK, which gave way to 103 Mota's Heart. Um, those are his current and most recent accomplishments. But um, Father Joe um, was the Archbishop's Delegate for Social Communication, head of the press office of the, Ar of the, of the Archdiocese, um, founder of the RTK Radio, Media Center, Newspaper, Elgence. He is the drafter of the media policy of the Archdiocese of Malta titled The Digital Face of the Lord is um, a great in the media sector. Obviously, he's currently visiting senior lecturer at the Department of Media and Communication at the Faculty of Media and Knowledge Sciences at the University of Malta. Um, he has, um, his contribution to Malta's media landscape was recognized by the Press Club, which presented him with his first gold award for journalism. Um, I believe he would be um, a great asset to this team of um, news people in in our in in our um, sorry news people uh, in our um I'm um, um strategy it's 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 going to come later on um uh, he's a great addition to our team thank you moving on. Yes, the third keynote is uh, Judge De Gaetano. Elaine will also give us a bit of input about him, please, since she has been liaising closer. Um, yes, yes. Uh, Chief Justice Emeritus Vincent De Gaetano is uh, um, the Attorney's General Office in 1979, and served as Deputy Attorney General from 89 to 94. In 1994, he was made the judge of the Superior Courts and in 2002 was appointed Chief Justice. In 2010, he was elected to the European Court of Human Rights, where me and a colleague, um, Ms. Ms. Lisa Hoven, had the pleasure, the immense pleasure of meeting him and hearing him and his um, passion for, um, for the laws and for justice. This. And I served as vice president of section four and later president of section three of that court. That means a huge responsibility not given to anyone. Um, he retired from the court in Strasbourg in September 2019 after serving a full nine year term. Um, it is a great honor that he would join, join us in this, um, in, in our endeavor, our little conference that is growing so much. Um, he also obtained his teacher's warrant as a lecturer and a lecturer in criminal law and law of criminal procedure at the University of Malta, where he lectures and still does um, regularly. He has lectured and published extensively in Malta and abroad on legal and human rights. He is um, a fountain of knowledge. Um, in March 2020, he was nominated by the Chamber of Advocates to sit on the Committee of Advocates and legal, and legal procurators at, of the Commission for the Administration of Justice. Very, very recently, um, he was also appointed to serve as Commissioner for Education. Um, that brings him, um, makes him one of our um, very important keynote speakers for this year. Thank you, Elaine. Third keynote also already confirmed with us is Professor Carmen Samut. Professor Samut is Pro-Rector for Student and Staff Affairs and Outreach at the University of Malta. She is actually a lecturer that teaches political communication, media, culture, and gender as well within the Department of International Relations. As Pro-Rector, she is responsible for the implementation of the area of inclusion within the university strategy. She chairs many Senate and Council committees 
related to students and to staff. She spearheaded the setting up of the Committee for Race and Ethnic Affairs, and she coordinates also with the Gender Issues Committee. She oversees the running of the Health and Wellness Center at the University of Malta, and obviously, amongst the many committees which she chairs, she is also on the board of Junior College. So she works also very close with us. The final keynote and final figure, uh, who we have also confirmed as a keynote speaker, speaker is Professor P.J. Shkembri, very well known in the local sector. He is also full professor in the Department of Biology in the University of Malta. He carried out postdoctoral research work in the University of Otago in New Zealand. He also had a Fulbright Senior Research Scholarship at the University of Delaware, United States, and also a visiting fellowship at the University of Durham in England. So he's quite a globetrotter. He is fellow also of the Royal Society of Biology and also a chartered biologist. What are his research interests? Well, marine ecology, impact of environmental change on the Mediterranean coast, marine biodiversity, phonistics, biogeography of the Maltese Islands, human impact on the Mediterranean, uh, ecosystems, and even conservation biology. If you had to look into his bibliography, you will notice he has authored some 200 papers in refereed scientific journals and more than 300 other works, including reports, conference papers, book chapters, books, etc., etc. Surely a keynote of substance as well. So these are the five keynotes who will actually be participating directly in the conference. Um, one last note before we pass on to a short question time, maybe somebody might have some query on the conference, is that there is still the possibility for whoever is doing a presentation in the conference to then submit a separate uh, uh, submission of his publication within Symposia Militensia. From the conference page, there is a very um, uh, convenient URL which will take you directly to the Symposia Militensia webpage. And there you can read about the norms and rules of submission and publication and peer reviewing within the Symposia Militensia journal. So the conference still offers you the possibility of publishing your work. I don't know if Elaine has anything else to add. Maybe we can open, if there, are, if there are maybe some questions or some queries which somebody would make, like maybe to pose. Maybe somebody from the attendees. Okay, well, we can proceed. I will now pass on uh, the words to my colleague Bernadine, and uh, she will take over now and open the roundtable discussion as moderator on the actual publications and the five panelists we have invited to share with us their views. Thank you so much. Okay, because I was unmuted. Excellent. Um, thank you, Carl. Thank you, Elaine and Mr. Schwerep. Um, the members of the Scientific Committee Editorial Board of the Symposium Militensia and I are very pleased to have you with us for this launch of Volume 16 and 17 of our journal Symposia Militensia. Unfortunately, last year, Dr. Christine borch Farruja, who was the editor at that time, was unable to launch Volume 16 due to the uncertainties of the pandemic and the partial lockdown. However, um, also, as explained before the conference, also was not being held last year. However, um, the scientific committee and the editorial board of the Symposium Militensia, we continued our work together with the authors. Um, and today we are delighted to launch this, this published work as well. Um, in the last years, the scientific committee and the conference organizing committee have worked very much hand in hand, and therefore um, those who participate in the conference may also submit the research work to our journal. So the Symposium Militensia um, gives the possibility to the authors, as also explained by Carl, um, that you can submit um, their academic work in different formats. Indeed, one can submit a commentary, a short report, or even an original research article. 
Um, all the submitted work is anonymously peer reviewed and the authors also are provided with constructive feedback on ways of how one can improve their academic work. Um, as you also may very well know, our journal is of a multidisciplinary nature and it therefore gives the opportunity to um, academic researchers to publish their work and contribute to knowledge from various research fields. Indeed, in these volumes, one can find papers covering aspects related to language, literature, architecture, active citizenship, transport, health, philosophy, and many more. This variety of academic work within one publication is what makes our journal so interesting. And therefore, I would like to invite you to read and enjoy our published papers in these editions. Um, you can either do this by obtaining a copy of the volumes from the principal's office or also by visiting the online um, library website where you can also find all the editions, um, including these two volumes, um, together with the website of the symposium as demonstrated before. OK, so lastly, um, like my, my previous speakers, um, we are very grateful um, I am very grateful to all the members of the scientific committee and editorial board members for all their help and support in peer reviewing and the editing process. Um, I would also like to thank Duncan for the designing of these volumes. He was really helpful in this. Um, a big thank you also goes to the principal and vice principals for always being there when in need. And last but not least, I would like to thank all authors for choosing to submit the research work in this journal. Um, it is all due to the cooperation, enthusiasm, spirit of the authors, reviewers and committee members that we could successfully make this launch today. Thank you so much. Right, so now we're going to proceed to the experiences of the five academic authors. Um, they all participated in the annual conference, have also published work in the Symposium Militensia, um, and therefore their experience can also um, give us hope to do some research in the future, and you can also um, be enticed to publish in the next editions as well. Uh, if you have any questions or any comments, you can drop them down in the question and answer um, here below. Okay, um, so, we can pass to our first presenter, Dr. Christine Borch-Farruja, um, who is an area coordinator at the Junior College and who was also the chair of the research committee for several years. Christine, I'll pass the word to you. Thank you. So, dear guests, I am very honoured to start off this roundtable of discussions during the book launch of our symposium, Militensia. I was responsible for the volume 16, which includes the proceedings of the conference organized by the University Junior College in September 2019. The conference entitled Practice saw the collaboration of a number of scholars, both local and foreign. In fact, our prestigious conference hosted academics from Malta, Italy, Poland, Hungary and the United States. For the very first time, we introduced the idea of the poster presentations together with the usual academic paper presentations. Following the September conference, the scientific committee of which I was the editor at that time, received quite a number of papers that delved into different issues from theories of education to economics, from literature to graph theory, from architecture to social capital, in all, we have received a total of 29 papers that have been reviewed by our team and edited especially for our journal. I must say that when Carl asked me to speak about my experience as editor of the papers resulting from our JC and well, multidisciplinary conference, I asked myself, from where do I start? I guess I have to take you all back to that afternoon in January 2017, immediately after the Christmas recess, when Carl and I were summoned at the principal's office to discuss a new project. 
a multidisciplinary conference that would give our academics a better sense of belonging and then reach out to local scholars and to international experts in various fields of knowledge. I remember smiling and telling the boss, you sure dream big at the same time. I remember Carl's determination that convincing me that we could do it. At that time, the team was very small, but everybody was full of adrenaline and we all worked hard for our first conference. We discussed at length about the title of our first conference until we reached a happy consensus, connection. In one single word, we had managed to show the true meaning of our conference. When the tours were distributed, Carl suggested I go for the editing process with John Borge Marx. Being totally green in the field, I admit I accepted, little knowing the hard work it entailed. We had to learn so much in a very short span of time, but Louis Sherry, editor of the symposia at the time, was very patient with us. I admit I learned a lot from the process, but that also meant no summer holidays, rushing through tight time frames, having to face the author's reactions after we made suggestions or corrections to their papers. Allow me to confess it was not easy. That many times it was frustrating and when the principal nominated me chair of the scientific committee the following year, I knew it meant a huge commitment. We discussed between us and chose a significant title, Breaking Barriers, and that meant setting up new thresholds, even for me in my new role. Luckily, I had a larger team, which was very hardworking, experienced, busting with positive energy. It was then that I understood I could not let them down. I had to repay the trust that the principal, the team, the authors themselves were investing in me. Looking back at those three years, I recall so many difficulties, infinite emails to answer every day, going through each and every paper for which I was fully responsible, studying first the Oxford and then the Harvard reference styles, coming for meetings all through the summer, sitting for hours at Duncan's desk as we went through the editing process for each diagram, each graph, each table, each paper. Spending hours on chat late in the evening with the principal, Carl and Elaine, while pooling the ideas. At the same time, I had the normal duties I could not forsake, my teaching load, other responsibilities at the college, a family to take care of, a house to clean. <laughs> Yet when I look back, my best times at the college usually point to the direction of the conference and the publications. Together we laughed, we strived to put the junior college on the academic map, both in Malta and abroad. At this, point, at this point, I would like to spend a couple of words on the paper that I presented in the following conference practice, praxis and which features in the latest publication we are launching today. The Oedipus and Electra Complex in Italian Literature of the Late 19th Century. As Ellen Key outlined in 1900, the 20th century centered on the child and literary theory started analyzing texts from a Freudian and Jungian perspective. Italian narrative texts from various authors of the late 19th century assert the Oedipus complex theory that the child's obsession with the mother deems the father a rival insofar as he exemplifies castration. In my paper, I study authors such as Luigi Capuana, Edmondo de Amicis, Carlo Dossi, Mario Pratesi, who express this fear of losing the mother in autobiographical works which denote their seduction of the preferred parent. Certain literary characters such as Pinocchio or Rosso Malpelo lack the sense of security the mother provides, hence they survive by substituting the biological mother with the fairy godmother, or in Malpelo's case, by exalting the father figure with whom he identifies. The paper also focuses on the Electra complex, which is prominent in Sibylla Ramos' confession of her childhood obsession for the father. This psychoanalytic approach developed later in the 20th century because the daughter has always occupied a marginal role in society. 
Sometimes the mother manifests ambiguous behavior given that she no longer feels obliged by nature to love her offspring. As a popular saying goes, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And these literary works epitomize the sheer significance of the parent figure with respect to the child's psychological and social well-being. I conclude by taking this unique opportunity of this afternoon's presentation to thank the two gentlemen who believed in me from the very beginning, fueling my very low self-esteem with encouragement, Mr. Schwireb and Karl. My gratitude reaches out to embrace Elaine and Bernadine, with whom I have worked endlessly to bring out the best in our conference and in the publications. And the teams behind the scenes, together with Duncan, who have worked endlessly for hours and hours. This conference, these publications have made us all very proud of our college. We have learned to aim higher, to accomplish. This is the message we wish to convey to our students, to our children who see in us the role models. Everything was given birth from a dream. So here I must conclude my speech exactly as I did my oration when graduating with my PhD way back in 2015. If you have a dream, never underestimate it, even though it seems too ambitious. Because if your dream does not intimidate you, it is not big enough. Thank you. Well done, Christine. Very interesting. Thank you. Really enjoyable as well in relation to your topics. Um, are there any comments or any questions which anyone would like to pass on? Um, following Christine's um, presentation. Okay. Okay. Many praise, Christine. Well done. Right, excellent. So uh, we're going to pass to our second speaker, um, Dr. Alexander Farouja, who is also um, a member of the scientific committee for a number of years. Um, and whose research stems from the mathematics field, um, which also inspire us in, in different ways as well. Alexander, I'll pass um, the word to you. Okay, are you here? I think so, okay. Uh, I need to... Okay. Uh, are you seeing this as well, um, the presentation? Yes. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you, um, Bernadine. And uh, I, I also want to thank the Junior College Multidisciplinary Conference Executive Committee for inviting me to speak during this book launch. Um, I'm going to speak about my experience during the conference and also give a brief outline on my research and the paper that was published in Posia Militancia, volume 16, the 2020 edition. Well, um, this is uh, a bit of uh, I don't know how to say it, but uh, here are well three instances of me during the conference. And the first one I'm uh, presenting in the 2017 conference, which was called Connections. And the second one I'm presenting in the 2018 conference, Breaking Barriers. And the third one I'm presenting in the 2019 conference. Um, uh, well, in the first, in the first one, my uh, paper was the connections of connections. That's what I called it. In the second one, since it was break barriers, I decided to break my own barriers, so to speak, and speak about something that was not purely mathematical. Uh, I spoke about philosophy, which uh, then goes into mathematics and computer science. And then the third one, which I'm going to talk about later as well, 
uh, I talked about spectral graph theory, which is my main area of expertise. Uh, by the way, thanks to Ricardo Flas for um, taking these three photos and making me look better than I actually do. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, why did I embark on presenting in all of, of these conferences so far? Um, well, one reason is that um, uh, I believe very much in multidisciplinarity. Um, my, uh, the, the conference, as was talked about many times, is multidisciplinary in nature. And uh, I believe that now, nowadays it is not uh, enough to just look into your own research and focus on your own area of research only. But important to also um, uh, be uh, open and be aware of what's happening in other disciplines. It's important that we're not narrow-minded and only focus on our own area of expertise. I, I believe this is very, very important. And uh, the, the conference, the Junior College Conference, allows um, people to do this because in this conference, um, it is multidisciplinary in nature, so one can hear the point of view of uh, another person who is perhaps of a totally different uh, comes from a totally different camp or a totally different area. Uh, I must say that uh, being from the mathematics field makes this easier for me, in a sense, because um, uh, mathematics is very easily ap applicable to many, many, many topics. And here you're seeing um, some of them. I'm, I'm sure that I missed a few. Uh, some of them, some of these are, I think, are quite obvious, like engineering, physics, uh, finance. Others, I would say, are a little bit surprising, like, for example, languages. Um, but remember that mathematics is a language in itself. So um, uh, the fact that the fact kind of mathematics also has syntax and semantics, for example. Also art, which is maybe even more surprising because um, mathematics usually is thought of as being um, more scientific. But I would say that uh, mathematics is also an art form. So um, yeah, if, if you're not artistic in, in, in mathematics, I think you wouldn't be a good mathematician. So it's important to also embrace the art of, uh, of, of yourself. And I, I believe that is, is uh, one way of doing it is to also um, look into what's happening in other art forms, like music, for example, or poetry, or um, other things that are artistic in, na in nature. Um, yeah, so that is um, about my experience in the in the um, in the conference. I think it, it is very very positive. It was very very positive. I met lots of people. Um, it also put me on the radar somewhat. Uh, um, thanks to the conference, people got to know about me as well as well as, well as I got to know about uh, other people. I made also a few friends, both from uh, both coming from uh, junior college and uh, other people who uh, work from junior college. And um, yeah, I think it is, it, it was very, very positive for me. Um, and that's why I always uh, look forward to present something in the, in, in the conference, as you saw. Um, yeah. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, publication of in, in 2020, which is called Spectral Graph Theory from Practice to Theory. Um, incidentally, this was the first slide of the presentation that I gave on, in 2019. Um, and I'm, I'm showing it because it has um, a summary of the paper itself. So I think it's a good way to to illustrate the paper from this uh, slide. Um, the paper uh, starts from the fact that spectral graph theory started with um, asking the question about hydrocarbons. 
this is a hydrocarbon. I don't know if you're seeing my my mouse cursor, yes. by the way. Yes, okay. So this is a hydrocarbon in, in chemistry. Um, and there was the question in chemistry of um, uh, how do we find the energy levels of pi electrons inside the hydrocarbon? So one way of answering the question was to uh, model this as a graph next to it here. We call this a graph in mathematics. And uh, as you're seeing, that um, the, the hydrogen atoms actually disappeared. I'm, um, the graph only contains the carbon atoms. We call it the carbon skeleton. And from the so-called eigenvalues of a matrix representing this graph, we could, uh, not we, but uh, the person who asked the question could, could find um, these uh, energy levels or at least an approximation of them. So that was the first application, which started in the 60s. So this is a relatively um, uh, recent application of mathematics. I'm, I'm saying recent because, as you know, mathematics um, has been with us for millennia, literally. So this, this uh, is very recent. And the one below it is also a second um, application where we have a drum or a vibrating membrane in general. And uh, we want to ask the question, uh, can we hear, um, yeah, can, can we hear the shape of a drum? Um, if I hear um, some drum or, or, or drum roll or something, can I from it reconstruct the, the drum itself? That is the question. And uh, essentially, um, this led to spectrograph theory and from, from there, um, um, these questions and other questions got analyzed. And then from, from there, um, uh, we could, for example, apply spectrograph theory into something like this network, which we call a bipartite graph. It's a bipartite graph because, as you can see, you can um, fill in all this um, nodes using only two colors, such that each node is adjacent to nodes of different colors. So that's, we call it two colorable. Um, and spectrograph theory tells us that um, uh, when a is tripartite, we can immediately, uh, from its spectrum, infer that it is in fact bipartite and hence it is two colorable. This is important because um, uh, knowing how many colors are necessary is an NP complete problem in uh, computer science. So, um, spectrograph theory here is partially answering a question that is um, very difficult to answer using computing. But, um, this, uh, this area of, of mathematics allows us to answer this question for bipartite graphs. And lastly here, I drew this uh, symbol here, which is the symbol for an search. Perhaps it's the most important uh, application of spectrograph theory nowadays. Um, uh, Google search, which started in 1998, um, uh, is a, an application of spectrograph theory. Essentially, you have um, uh, you, you have many web pages linked to each other. I can go from one web page to another by clicking on certain links, and this gives me a graph. This gives me a big network, and then from this graph, I can um, represent it using a particular, a very particular matrix. Act from which I can extract the third eigenvector of that matrix, and that will give me an ordering of my web pages, and then the most important one will be on top, and the second most important, the second, and so on and so forth. And from there, essentially, Google became billionaire. <laughs> so uh, I think it, apart from being a very important application, it's also, um, uh, I think, the, the most Money making mathematics uh, paper of all time, I would say, um, the, the, the Google paper, uh, which, by the way, you can download for free and it's, it's available online. Um, uh, it's by Sergey Brin and Larry Page, which are the two um, persons who founded Google themselves. And uh, yeah, and from there, of course, the algorithm got improved. And as you know, now Google are. Um, multi-billionaire company and everybody uses Google for some sort of um, e 
even hard work today from, coming from Google, not just software. Yeah, and uh, a little bit more uh, from this um, application came, for example, this um, uh, theoretical um, application of knowing whether two graphs are cospectral, for example. Uh, cospectral graphs are graphs that have the same spectrum. So this is the spectrum of these two graphs. These two graphs are different. And yet they have the same spectrum, which answers this question then, okay? The answer then is no, um, you can have um, the, you can hear a drum and then reconstruct two different drum shapes that, that make the same sound, essentially. And these are also, these are also um, applications that came after those original two applications that are also uh, use spectral graph theory. The P versus MP problem, which I have already mentioned briefly. Uh, the Estrada index is an index used in protein folding in biology. So as we're seeing um, many, many applications from different areas of study. Um, spectral cross clustering allows um, statisticians or all, and also scientists to know whether how data is clustered. Um, you, you can, uh, if you have data that's clustered in certain ways. Uh, spec clustering allows you to see these clusters. And uh, more recently, control theory um, in, 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 in the sense of, for example, robotics, where um, uh, you can, for example, have a few robots that are trying to um, form certain shapes, like move so that they form the letter T, say, to give a very simple example. And the question is, is, uh, is it possible, for example, for them to lead them into this shape or do you need more than one robot that acts as this leader? And uh, surprisingly, spectral graph theory uh, um, allows us to uh, answer or uh, attempt at least to answer this question because this is an ongoing area of research. Um, I, um, th that's it for me, and uh, thank you very much for um, uh, hearing what I, what I had to say. And once again, thank you for uh, allowing me to, to speak during, um, th during this book launch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Um, although some of us might not be experts in mathematics, you assured us that we make use of it every day. We also make use of the spectral graph theory unknowingly almost every day. So, so that's enlightening, knowing how we make use of some things without knowing and, and therefore seeing what is happening behind this, this scenes is also highly interesting. Um, uh, Carl, are, are there any other questions which, which might have been? I have a question for Alex, if you don't mind. Alex has this great talent of rendering uh, so accessible, difficult concepts of maths, and for this I admire him so much. But today I was particularly struck by his statement that if you're not artistic, you cannot be good in mathematics. And this is such um, uh, a stereotypical, this, and, and the antithesis of a stereotypical formation which I have had in mathematics as a kid. How did you discover this? Was it through personal uh, itinerary in your academia, or was there a mentor who mentored you on it? because this is a groundbreaking also for the pedagogy of mathematics, Alex, I think. Yeah, it is, it is. Well, um, I think that for sure uh, people who taught me and who were mentors for me, for sure gave me this, uh, this, this, this love for mathematics and, this, and gave me the fact that mathematics is also an art. Um, I would say that um, People have often have the a misconception of medics as being, you know, um, I won't say boring, but being perhaps mechanical and, you know, because uh, if you want to solve this, you do this. If you want to solve that, use that method. So it's kind of like uh, if I want to uh, bake a pie, follow these steps and you'll end up with a pie, so to speak. And uh, mathematics is, is, is not like that. Um, mathematics is about um, solving problems that nobody else has solved yet. I mean, if you're if you're a mathematician, that's what you do. 
And of course, order to do this, you need uh, insight, you need uh, critical thinking, you need luck as well. And you need, uh, you need some, some sort of inspiration somehow. And uh, that is very much artistic to me. I mean, from where that inspiration comes from? It's not something scientific, surely. It's something artistic. I mean, how, how, does, how, does, uh, uh, how does an artist know uh, if, if, whether to use brush or whether to use pencil? I don't know because I'm not an artist, but an artist knows this. And how, did, how did he or she learn this? I mean, I, I'm glad it's not something taught. And not, not everything in art is taught. Most of it, I would say, is innate. And I, I believe that mathematics has this as well. Um, if you want, if, if you actually end up um, proving and discovering things, it needs to be, you need to get inspiration from somewhere. And inspiration is not something that is learned usually. It's something that you, it, it comes to you somehow. And I, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it, it's like when somebody, when a poet writes a poem, how did he or she get that poem? When some composer writes music, how did he or she get that music? It's, I think it's, it's the same idea. And that's, that's why I, uh, I think that mathematics is also an art. Thank you very much. Uh, you have to feel it. <laughs> Excellent. So thank you so much, Alex. It was really a pleasure and, and very interesting. OK, so we will pass to our third speaker, um, Dr. Liliana Maric, who is also a senior lecturer at the Junior College. Um, and he will, who will also who did um, some research in, in the field of inclusion and also of disability. Liliana, I'll pass the word to you. Thank you. Give me a second. I need to share my screen, please. No problem. So thank you for this uh, opportunity. I'm really excited about it. Um, the paper that I presented um, was making disabled people's voices uh, vulnerable. My experience of the conference from a logistical point of view was that it was very well organized. And the organizers were aware of means how to make the conference accessible to participants with different needs. Um, for practical examples are, for example, there was a lift available, the rooms were close to each other where there were the conferences, um, the sessions being held. This is very important for people with mobility limitations um, and it reduces time and physical effort. Also, there, um, um, there was light and temperature um, regulation, and also distractions, you know, um, uh, background noise um, uh, was kept very low, and this will help in reducing even distractions. Um, the time when it was um, held did not clash with my teaching schedule, and that was also um, very good. Something else which um, was useful was that um, information was available digitally and it will help even persons um, who need to use assistive technology to um, get hold of all the information available. My experience of the, of the conference from an academic point of view was that um, contemporary themes were discussed. And it was highly motivating to attend and participate in different sessions. In fact, um, I had the pleasure to attend some uh, related to my area and others. I went, I attended just for fun, but they were really um, enriching and a source of learning. Um, it was also an opportunity for exposure of one's research and that of others. And actually, um, as um, others have said, we had time to um, make new friends and connections. Um, the feedback from uh, the uh, reviewers before the paper was accepted and from the floor during the presentation was a source of critical reflection. In fact, um, presenting a paper is also um, uh, a very enriching experience. I can have to say that the organizers ensured that it was a positive experience. I mean, people who are novel in this area, they were very encouraged, me included. And I felt um, at ease even with the, um, uh, with the, with the board. Um, I also had the opportunity to um, be the chairperson in one of the sessions. 
And uh, again, um, I felt um, prepared and supported because the documentation, um, logistical information, they were available at hand. And this facilitated the efficiency and the coordination of the whole um, experience in itself. The aims of the paper um, were, for example, to present uh, the research findings that show the mundane challenges um, that disabled persons live and how society makes their voices vulnerable. Now, here, um, the, 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 the scope was that we tend to take day-to-day -day experiences for granted. So, um, by um, stopping and listening to the participants' experiences, it helped me to understand and reflect on things that we tend to take for granted, even as educators. The other aim was to reflect upon the experience of inclusive education of disabled young people with physical and sensorial disability at further and higher education levels and within the employment sector. Um, I have to say that um, the uh, disabled people are a minority group, you know, even amongst the population of students and uh, therefore um, it is easy that one will forget or will not give as much attention um, to the needs of the students. In fact, um, in this study, uh, I focused on the environmental, the educational, and the social enabling factors and disabling barriers. The, the third aim was to utilize um, poetic creative writing to contribute to discourse in the fields of critical disability studies and inclusive education. So, um, I wanted to remain faithful to the authentic experiences that the participants were sharing with me while remaining, you know, um, respecting the confidentiality. And uh, um, uh, one way which was at the same time experimental for me, how I could represent their experiences, their, um, the challenges that they had to face um, through um, poetic experience. So basically, um, some of their um, words were actually composed to form, um, to form a poem. Critical disability theory was utilized to examine the politics of disablement and ablement of young adults in their attempt to attend post and tertiary education and finding employment. Um, so here I sought to understand um, the political and even the power underpinnings uh, in relation to the self, the, the disabled person, vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, the relationships with peers, with uh, educators, lecturers, I mean the administrators, um, parents, and even the community at large. And uh, at the same time, um, um, during the process, while they were attending uh, post-secondary and university, in preparation for their employment. The interpretation sought to promote emancipation and social inclusion from a rights-based perspective. Um, addressing um, inclusion from a rights-based uh, perspective is still contentious. Um, unfortunately, there are still um, individuals who consider it from a charity-based um, standpoint or uh, from a deficit mentality approach. Um, which shows that there's still um, so much work to be done. Improvements are undergoing, you know, all the time from year to year, even within um, my experience uh, as an educator, but work still has to be um, done. So that's why such a conference will help even to create this consciousness. The uh, methodology, um, uh, the paper focused on one-time semi-structured interviews carried out with 12 selected young disabled adults and the interpretive phenomenological analysis was used to analyze the transcripts uh, for the um, ideographic um, essence of the lived experience of the participants. Actually, what they were experiences which was singular but yet so valid um, in order to, for us to become aware and understand um, the reality. The selected excerpts of the interviews were transformed into poetic creative uh, writing. The findings, um, uh, the findings, the participants remarked that unless disabled persons' reflections about their experiences are listened to, 
and a process of rumination is activated, emancipation of disabled persons is unlikely to be initiated. The uh, participants put great effort to instill consciousness among non-disabled persons of their rights and reality. Now, I would like to highlight something about the notion of listening. And um, here it emerged that the process of consultation um, with disabled persons is crucial um, because it also shows um, the, 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 the person um, that what they have to say is valued. So that is also empowering both for the person and even for the listener. So it's a, a, a mutual uh, empowering process and the, the, the process of consultation is, um, is a must. At the same time, one has to give the opportunity for one to voice himself or oneself um, and express oneself freely in the way you know, it is being experienced. The, um, the other main finding um, was that the poems highlighted different pressing issues that disabled students experience, such as disclosure, empowerment and community building, support from parents, peers, lecturers and administrators, self-help strategies, assistance and disability activity. Now, if I may, I would like to highlight some points on, on certain key terms. Here we have um, disclosure. So um, uh, here, this element of disclosure is very sensitive uh, because it could be like, um, uh, why should I disclose personal information? Why isn't the system already accessible for me without any need for me to disclose something? But on the other hand, it can be argued, if you don't tell me certain details, I cannot ensure that your needs are being met. And I think this is something we also share as educators um, sort of uh, to which side uh, should I push more uh, so that the, the needs of the person are being met. Um, as regards empowerment, okay, as regards empowerment, here there is the emphasis that we encourage the, the students um, to develop agency, that they are able to take their own decisions after being well informed. And also that um, definitely they will not be treated differently. The inform the informants told me that they want to be treated differently. Um, to to, answer, to, to they they would like to be treated as equally and fairly, um, like any other student. Um, also, um, overprotection is not recommended. The, the participants claim that they don't want to be overprotected, but otherwise. Uh, because otherwise it will limit their independence and um, in, in the way that they will become autonomous learners as well. Uh, regarding um, lecturers here, the point of, of lecturers, um, they were considered to be as the uh, main stakeholder in whether making a successful inclusive education experience or not. So this puts a lot of pressure on us educators um, in being cognizant of our power, so we have to use it um, sensitively for the benefit of our students. Um, also, um, uh, the, the, the findings indicated that um, the infrastructure for distance learning is essential for some students. Uh, the COVID-19 situation uh, has pushed us to develop this area, so uh, the silver lining in the dark cloud is that um, ultimately some goodness is being experienced through this pandemic. So yes, um, I'm sure of it, myself and my colleagues, um, we, we have worked and we have succeeded in this um, aspect as well. Um, regarding the, the self-help um, element, uh, the participants indicated that they work hard to develop resilience, um, to, to face their challenges, to overcome their barriers that they face, and at the same time to strengthen the enabling barriers. Okay, they make um, aware others what works with them or what doesn't work with them. Um, from a character point of view, they develop you know, persuasion skills, um, reassurance skills for those people who doubt, will, will she be able to do it? Uh, she has the capacity, you know, so even from a character point of view, they have to be um, uh, well determined, very determined, and um, they persevere as well. Um, uh, the other aspect of assistance 
it emerged when um, the importance of good friendship. Um, peers help um, uh, disabled persons to overcome day-to-day -day, um, difficulties. For example, persons with hearing impairment, they don't understand fully what is being said um, by the lecturer. Um, uh, so rather than pretending to pass, you know, that yes, I'm in this understanding, but in reality not, but actually notes will be um, uh, given or one will explain and will understand for lip reading close by. And as well, uh, the goodwill of different um, uh, members, staff, um, both academic, non-academic staff, it was mentioned a lot. Um, so the goodwill of individuals that we join forces to help others, basically. The, the last point was disability um, activism. The idea is the importance of dialogue and collaboration to transform the, the, the situation okay, that the person is in. And even from you know, a college or you know, the campus itself, it will be improved. The conclusion in creating community building a socio-cultural practice pro-inclusion can create a collective commitment to promote social justice and celebrate diversity in a way that empowers individuals irrelevant of um, their differences. Moreover, essentially, uh, the process of uh, living together reaps educational benefits. And this um, leads me to, to, to highlight um, the importance of the of three pillars that I believe a lot in democracy, in education, um, social justice, and uh, human rights. And they are the basis for a sound, inclusive education, and also it will help in deconstructing and reconstructing the um, learning landscape. So very essential, but, but first we need to give the opportunity. We need to give the opportunity for um, uh, students to grow and flourish and reach their um, learning potential irrelevant whether they have a visible or a hidden impairment. So we need to be more watchful, more sensitive, um, to, to, uh, to our students and also we'll be um, proactive in preparing you know, our lectures as accessible to a diverse population of students as much as possible. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I hope that you find it interesting. Thank you, um, Liliana. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for reminding us um, how important it is that we include um, and, and various aspects and points um, that can help us realize um, aspects of social inclusion. Um, it's, it is always good to remember these aspects because um, teaching in an inclusive environment is teaching in a healthy environment. So thank you so much. You're welcome. So um, we will pass on to the fourth um, speaker of today, who is Nikki Young, um, who is also a senior lecturer at the junior college, and he is coming from the field of philosophy. Um, he was also a contributing um, member of the scientific committee. So I'll pass on the words to Nikki. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, well, the junior college is, of course, a teaching institution, uh, but it's not just that. Uh, it is also a research institution with many of its academics contributing to their respective fields, to publications and participation in various conferences and, acad and other academic events. Um, symposia offers, uh, Symposia Militancia offers a, a great opportunity for publication and uh, I believe this is for two reasons. Uh, first of all, because it's a peer-reviewed journal and it therefore provides potential authors with the possibility to critically reflect on their area of research. Uh, secondly, the fact that it is open access means that it is capable of reaching a very wide audience. Well, I, I remember when I first started working at the junior college, I believe it has been almost seven years ago now, uh, I would often uh, discuss different subjects such as biology, art, literature, 
and marketing with a few of my colleagues. Uh, in, my, in, in my experience, the junior college provided a, a perfect environment for the promotion of multidisciplinarity in the sense that its infrastructure made it possible for staff members from different departments to interact and share views and ideas. Back in 2017, uh, Mr. Schwirep was, was, was prompt to seize on this opportunity provided by the junior college. And uh, he approached uh, a number of colleagues of mine and myself, and uh, together we organized the first junior college conference. Uh, that year, we also set up the basic infrastructure for future conferences. Uh, the first conference was called Connections. As the title suggests, uh, the aim was to bring together different academics, both within the junior college and outside it, in order to share our research, interests, and ideas. Since 2017, I have been involved in the organization of the conference or related symposia for almost every year. And it, it is such a great satisfaction to see the conference grow and develop in these new and interesting ways. It is also worth mentioning that the conference has always hosted uh, keynote speakers of international recognition. In my field, for example, uh, I can mention uh, Dr. David Roden, our first international speaker, uh, a leading figure in the field of philosophical post-humanism. Or for example, I can also mention Professor Maurizio Ferraris, who is a very important Italian philosopher, a prolific author, and the founder of a philosophical movement called New Realism, and a one-time collaborator of the very well-known philosophers Gianni Vattimon and uh, the, uh, the, the French thinker Jacques Derrida. This year, the conference's keynote shall be Professor Tiziana Andina from the University of Turin, who is a world-class academic in her own right, especially in the field of social ontology and aesthetics. Well, with all this in view, I need to stress how important this annual academic conference is for the promotion of collegiality, the sharing of ideas, and the formation of new, interesting, and long-lasting professional relationships between individuals and the respective academic institutions. So I encourage all my colleagues to participate and contribute to this year's conferences conference as well as to other conferences, uh, as this will most definitely broaden their knowledge as well as their academic horizons. Well, uh, the, the, the article I have written for Symposia Militensia is entitled Only to Peas in a Pod on the Overcoming of Ontological Taxonomies. And as the title indicates, it deals with the concept of ontotaxonomy. The notion was developed by a contemporary American philosopher, Graham Harman, uh, in order to criticize a deeply entrenched philosophical tendency, but not exclusively, it, also, it is also found in, in the social sciences, for instance, uh, to, to, to postulate a categorical difference or taxonomy between different ontological domains, with one belonging to humans and the other one to anything else that is excluded from humanity. We can think of um, for example, the nature versus culture dichotomy. Um, in my paper, I show how these how three fundamental principles underlying Harman's philosophy are derivable from his critique of ontotaxonomy, ultimately. Well, the first I call the principle of ontological democracy, and it states that uh, the world itself is not a whole standing in contrast to human transcendence. Rather, the critique of ontotaxonomy implies that there are potentially infinite and a potentially infinite number of multiple beings, and that humans are no different in kind from all these other beings. I call the second element of Harman philosophy in this paper ontological accretionism, and this uh, element rejects the rigid distinction between the natural and the artificial. In Harman's philosophy, each and every entity, each and every thing, is itself multiple, in the sense that it is itself an aggregate of different parts. And therefore, what we usually call the natural is to some extent artificial, and the other way around. The final principle I called non-reciprocal entanglement 
And uh, this principle shows that entities in nature are not holistically intertwined, but rather interact by proxy, um, uh, such that a lot of work needs to be done for entities to actually connect and influence one another. Well, in essence, the point of my article is twofold. First of all, I wanted to draw attention to this concept in Graham Harman's philosophy. Graham Harman is a philosopher of international recognition, but somehow this concept has not gained enough attention. It was mentioned in one of his books in 2016, but since then he hasn't mentioned it in, in, in too many of his other works, bar one article published, I believe, last year. Um, so I wanted to emphasize on this concept and uh, emphasize how important it is to, to his philosophy, but also to contemporary philosophy more generally and social theory. And second, I wanted to show that ultimately his entire philosophy can in fact, in fact be built out of this rejection of ontotaxonomy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki, um, for enlightening us in relation to your philosophical thinking um, also for, for your success in, in, in making these arguments in relation to a, a living philosopher as well. Um, um, thank you so much also for your motivation in relation to the conference and for the success and and the enjoyment of participating and listening to the speakers within the conference itself. Thank you so much, Nikki. Thank you. Right, so our last speaker um, is Dr. Mary Grace Vella, who is a senior lecturer at the Junior College, who also was a member of the committee for a number of years, and whose research focuses greatly on sociology, crime and inequality. I'll pass the word to you, Mary Grace. So thank you very much, Berdarneen, and for the invitation to share my experiences on this um, Junior College Multidisciplinary Conference. Um, I must admit it was um, a huge experience for me. Um, and basically, I participated in the conference on a number of fronts. First and foremost, I was a member of the organization team um, way back in 2017. And I would like to thank the principal for actually giving me the opportunity to form part of this team. Um, uh, then I was part of the scientific committee um, and I'll be speaking a bit more on the, my role in the scientific committee. But uh, apart from being part of the internal organizing team, I obviously try to participate actively in the conference, both through the facilitation of sessions, but also through authorship and publication. And basically, I will try to speak a bit about my various experiences, levels of experiences in the conference. So basically, initially, um, the main name of the conference was actually, as my colleagues have suggested, that it is to provide a periodic platform for staff to present their ideas and research. So that was, I think, one of the um, underpinning um, aims and objectives of the conference. Obviously, I remember the first time that we met, we had quite a long and lengthy meeting and discussing the practical issues, the logistics, the expenses, who will be involved, the profile of the conference, and actually we wanted to have quite high profile um, speakers, both locally and internationally. The idea of publication, because the idea that um, actually the proceedings of the conference should be published and discuss also the idea of using the Symposia Militensia. And yes, uh, a main name was actually that of um, acting as a form of continuous professional development um, for academic staff at the junior college. Um, with the idea of sharing ideas together, sharing experiences, and also sharing our research um, interests. Um, another thing which I think we discussed, if I remember correctly, in quite in depth, was the theme of the conference. And I think there was a general agreement that the conference should be as inclusive as possible, enabling subjective interpretations of subjects from different perspectives, and also addressing current and topical issues. And in fact, I think uh, a main strength of the conference is actually that it is very multidisciplinary, it is interdisciplinary, 
um, obviously from my background in systems of knowledge, I really do appreciate a lot this idea of interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity because it is a way how actually one can connect um, different research interests together, but also different people together. And that's how one consoli consolidates um, strengths in, in one's particular area. And the idea was also that of linking research with practice. So the idea is that one gives a practical um, on hand um, dimension to research and also to enhance collaboration um, um, behind um, one's particular research interest. Mm -hmm. And basically, we see that um, the, there were then two main committees. One committee was more related to the idea of organization, executive, logistics, promotion, um, whereas the other committee was more related to the academic part of the conference. Um, I formed part of the scientific committee and basically we were mainly responsible um, for reviewing papers and doing editorial work. Um, this may sound cool um, and I actually like this part of the work, but in actual fact it is quite um, meticulous and you have to be quite meticulous and um, sometimes it does involve tedious work as well, you know, those who are part of the scientific committee, um, I'm sure they're having nightmares about the referencing styles, the full stop, the commas, whatever. And obviously one of um, um, the one of the objectives of the scientific committee also of seeing that the papers are in line with the objectives of the conference. Um, uh, we discussed also and worked on the development of a number of guidelines in order to help ensure greater standardization when it comes to um, the papers and also to develop a system of um, anonymous and blind multiple peer reviews in order to be as transparent and objective as possible. Um, uh, when it comes to my other um, um, other forms of participation in the conference, I tried um, obviously to take quite an active role. I facilitated a number of sessions, both plenary and parallel sessions, and I really enjoyed, I must say, to be part of the audience. And in fact, um, I had the opportunity to attend a number of um, presentations. Some of the presentations I attended because I had a direct interest in the topic discussed, but I also attended a number of presentations um, on topics which I had actually no idea upon. So basically, I think it was a very good opportunity um, for anyone actually really to engage in topics where he or she is already interested in, but also to pursue topics where one has no idea or inclination about. Um, so I think that was a very um, positive aspect of the, the conference that you could actually go in and out of different um, sessions and to follow any um, presentation um, which you may actually find interesting. Um, I also try to contribute um, in terms of authorship contribution and in fact now I'll be discussing a bit I mean uh, just giving an overview of my contributions in the publication of proceedings. So basically, the topic of the 2017 conference was that of connections. And I focused my paper on actually these connections. And this time, and this time um, by focusing on non-voting patterns of behavior and the process of disconnecting from partisan politics. Um, um, so that is that was the 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 topic that I addressed by taking um the topic of disconnections and addressing it to electoral forms of behavior. Um, the 2018 conference focused on breaking barriers. And um, my paper for this conference actually addressed um, the breaking barriers of patriarchy. And basically I took the issue of abortion and reproductive rights and analyzed it from a feminist perspective and that's why I focus on the topic of breaking the barriers of patriarchy. Um, Praxis, um, the, the title, the theme of the conference of 2019 was that of applying theory in practice. 
And here I talk um, uh, a topic which I um, obviously lecture in systems of knowledge, that of democracy, and basically um, deconstructed it in terms of the difference from its theoretical principles to its dictatorial practice. Um, the idea was also, however, rather than just um, critically appraising um, um, the, the, the practice of democracy, I also aim to promote some form of recommendations for actually um, taking back, um, uh, taking back um, the practice of democracy to its theoretical ideas. So the title of my paper was actually Democracy from Theory to Dictatorial Dysphasia to Anarchist Euphrasia. And to come to the last publication, um, basically, um, this topic again is quite a, a different topic totally. And basically, I co authored this paper with a very uh, good student of mine, Ms. Michaela Cini. Um, and this research actually formed part of her uh, BA dissertation in criminology. And basically, the topic addressed the issue of necrophilia, notorious yet obscure, by actually focusing also on the legal lacuna that exists on this type of paraphilia within the Maltese um, criminal code. So basically, that is um, uh, the, the, the theme of the paper um, in the 2020 symposium. So basically, to come to um, a conclusion, basically, I think that it was a very positive, intriguing and learning experience on all levels of my participation in the conference. I really appreciate the fact that it is multidisciplinary, that it is interdisciplinary, because that's how one can collaborate together. Um, I also really appreciate the fact that the team is inclusive enough in order to enable creative and innovative topics and themes to be addressed, to address current and topical issues, and also maybe to address actually controversial issues and topics which may actually be underrated. But I think um, one can never underrate um, any topic. And um, if a topic is controversial because it actually needs to be discussed and it actually needs to be brought um, in the open. So basically, I think a very um, important um, byproduct of the conference is actually that it's helped a lot in reflective practice. And it, I think it actually helped me a lot to question the terms of reality that I usually take for granted, maybe because I just look from my own um, academic perspective field of study. And so the idea is that, yes, it, it should help in reflecting in, in help us to reflect on our practices in order to become um, better practitioners. And in fact, I think the conference was very helpful also because of this inter and multidisciplinarity to help us to see things from different perspectives. And I really think that this is a very important component um, because if one only looks at one perspective, at one dimension, then it's actually losing um, the wider picture. Um, another, and I'll come to my actual the last slide, I think another um, very positive experience of the conference um, is the fact that many academics who actually presented their papers um, did so with the intent of promoting positive progressive social change. So it was not just a question of remaining too theoretical, remaining um, just on the basis of research, but actually that of applying research to promote policy change. And I think that is the ultimate scope of any research um, which is um, undertaken. The idea that research should be actually um, undertaken with the aim of providing a critical appraisal of situations and also of promoting progressive social change, whether it is legislative change, policy change, or changes in program implementation. So um, that's it um, from my part. I, I, I been, having been part of the um, scientific committee, I admit, and part of the organizing team in general, I recognize um, the hard work um, that this, the organization of this conference and the publication of the paper all entails. 
So basically, um, I, I, I actually would like really to thank the team, the, the current team, for the excellent work. And please do keep it up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary Grace. Um, thank you so much also for motivating us to continue for, and thank you for your praise. And thank you for emphasizing also um, the, the, the power and the, the beauty of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, um, multidisciplinary. Um, and therefore, um, it is, it is uh, motivating your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, um, most of the questions are in relation to praise. I'm not sure if there are any other comments or, or questions that anyone um, would like to make. It doesn't seem so, Carl. Um, so I would like to thank so much um, our dear presenters for sharing with us um, your experiences, um, your hard but very fruitful work. Um, that you contributed um, to the Symposia Militancia and also your experience in relation to the conference itself. Um, thank you also for those um, being present with us here this afternoon. Um, your support is greatly appreciated. And uh, I hope it's, it's the last thing um, before our Easter recess, our break, and it motivates us to continue going on in the future. And hopefully we'll see you also in the conference and also receive um, your research work in the future. Thank you, Bernadine. Uh, thank you as well, everybody, for attending. I just would like to thank everybody again, the principal, Christine and uh, her editorial team that produced volume 16, Bernadine and her editorial team that produced volume 17, Elaine and also her organizational team, um, Bernadine and all the scientific committee, the splendid work Duncan does, and also Ricardo, who is so patient with us, taking these wonderful uh, uh, photos, which you can use so easily uh, for the presentation of our material. Thank you for all this light this evening. You have cast away a lot of darkness. And I hope to see many of you at the conference. Thank you so much for being so professional and multidisciplinary. Now I have to rush because I have a lecture on Dante for the next two hours. Have a nice evening and thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Happy Easter. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye, grazie.